This room is full of professionals, planners, park advocates. Um, so what we hear tonight, I ask all of you to take into the process you're going to hear about uh, as we, we think about the next plan for the city, uh, for the park system. Um, which brings me to the speakers tonight. So um, uh, we have two speakers. The, uh, the, our, our guest speaker, our highlighted speaker is Mitchell Silver, um, who has had an extraordinary career uh, focused on architecture, planning, and now running one of the most respected complex park systems in America, New York City. Um, it's over, it's a, about a $580 million annual budget, almost $600 million annually, uh, serving all five boroughs. He was telling me today there's over 5,000 assets, buildings, pools, all sorts of things within that system that he's responsible for. Um, and it really, I believe, for the 9 million residents, and if you really think about New York, the parks really make that city one of the greatest cities on the planet ever. And so uh, it's, 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 a, it's, it's just astounding what he has to think about and do and plan for. Um, and he's in the process of thinking about how parks interplay with complex issues such as climate resiliency, homelessness, equity for all people, aging, uh, an aging demographic. Um, and he's leading planners thoughtfully, systematically, and with respect to all those around him. And he'll share that perspective tonight in his presentation and then a conversation with Brandt. But before Mitchell uh, speaks, we're gonna, we've asked Carrie Ann Christensen to come up, and she's a senior planner with the Minneapolis Park and Rec Board, leading our, our compre the comprehensive plan here for the Park Board that really is about how do, we, how do we extend Minneapolis Park System to continue to be a park system for all or, or more so. Um, she's uh, guiding the Minneapolis Comprehensive Planning uh, and setting goals and val that will set the goals and values for all of our commissioners and really help the Park Board shape what guides the major decisions that they have to make. So this process is actually actively going on right now. So there's materials that we hope that you, hearing from Carrie Ann talking about it a little bit, uh, you and hearing the conversation from Commissioner Silver, you'll, you'll think about how you might uh, interact with that plan over the next year, because that's really going to inform our commissioners, um, the park commissioners here, on how to guide the next 10 years of decision making. So uh, with that, I uh, will turn it over to Carrie and uh, have her share a little bit about what's happening here, and then Commissioner Silver will, will take it from there. Thank you for coming, and then make sure you do track your questions. We'll add those at the end. So Carrie. All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks to the Minneapolis Park Foundation and Tom for having us here tonight to talk about the Minneapolis Park Board um, Parks for All process, the, the MPRB 2021 Comprehensive Plan, um, and to have a chance to engage with Commissioner Silver. Um, in, our, in our conversation earlier tonight, I actually got to, to spend an hour with um, Commissioner Silver and uh, a crew of youth from Minneapolis, the youth design team that are working on the Comprehensive Plan alongside me. Um, along with lots and lots of other staff, some of whom are in this room tonight. Um, and we had such a great conversation, and I think uh, there was two things that stuck out to me that I really appreciated, he said. One was that we're such a planful city in Minneapolis. Uh, we, are, we are very thoughtful in our, our thinking of the future um, and being clear about charting our course. And I'm really honored to be part of charting the course of the next 10 years of Minneapolis parks. Um, but he also said, and have encouraged us and dared us to think about planning for a specific future in mind and to make sure that we're naming what, um, what the future is that we're planning for. So I, I think uh, it came at a really great time to hear um, those words, and I want to just plant those seeds for all of you in the audience tonight, too, to, to consider that. What is, it, what is the future that we are planning for? Uh, what are the challenges? What are the opportunities? So as you know, as you hopefully know, the Minneapolis Park Board, we are our own government agency, our own elected body, we have our own taxing authority, we hold our own land, and therefore we also set our own policies. So we have a, a current comprehensive plan that's been in place since 2007. We um, need to update that comprehensive plan uh, by 2020, so, and so that it goes into effect, our new one will go into effect in 2021. Um, so this comprehensive plan it uh, is our agency policy direction and touchstone. As Tom mentioned, it's based on our shared values with community, agency staff, and commissioners alike. It'll provide guidance in setting the budget, 
policy development, programming, the physical parks um, over the next decade. It's also a great tool for communicating to our staff, our commissioners, and the general public about what we do and value. And it will build on what works in our system currently, as well as identify gaps and opportunities for growth. What it is not, it will not start from scratch. It will build on all the great work that's been happening over the last decade plus at the Park Board, well, in fact, the last 130 years of the Park Board, um, guiding, you know, building on the service area master plans, um, conversations around policing, uh, strategic directions put forth by our commissioners, activity plans like skateboard activity plan and urban ag activity plan, um, our recreation work, our CIP, our budget, um, and more. It will also, it's, it's separate from the city's comprehensive plan, so like I said, we're a separate agency, we have a separate process. It will not take the place of the parks and open space chapter in the city's comprehensive plan, um, and it is not, it's not a Met Council mandated comprehensive plan, which for those of you planning wonks out there, is an interesting detail. Um, so here's, in, in our initial scoping, these are some of the topics, just to give you a sense of how broad this is and how broad we'd like you to, to engage with us around all these different issues according to the sort of thinking about the future and dreaming about um, what we'd like to see in our parks over the next decade around play and funding and habitat, maintenance. What do multi-generational parks look like as we, as we grow as a city? What do we, what do we wanna, how do we wanna work with our historic resources? What do park events look like, arts and culture, sports? How do we make better data-driven decisions or continue to make better, or continue to make data-driven decisions? What does it mean to plan and create parks and jobs for youth? What, is, what do the parks look like as we consider climate change, safety, gender inclusion, partnership, equity, and workforce development? So there's lots of different, as I mentioned, it's community, staff, commissioners are all weighing in on shaping this vision. Um, and this is a little bit more of a breakdown on, on the who. So I mentioned the youth design team already, um, but of course leadership and staff. Uh, but there's two particular sort of um, community groups and community um, ways for community to engage in the process that I wanted to highlight. One is the community collaborators and the other is this exciting new tech tool that we just rolled out last week. So this is um, one of our community collaborators. So community collaborators, it was a, a series of small grants that we've given out to community groups, informal neighborhood groups, faith-based institutions, um, to organize their own conversations about parks and to do it in ways that are right for them to build on their existing um, convenings or work. Uh, and this particular communi uh, community collaborator is with the Volunteers of America who happen to have a really fabulous uh, Hmong elders social group uh, and lunch program. They do a lot of field trips and have um, a community center where they spend a lot of time together. And so we, we had a, they brought a bus full of these elders to Loring Park and we actually did this amazing photo shoot for a day with them just being in the park and then did uh, uh, some brief oral histories with each of them to ask them about what, what they want to see in their parks, what their relationship is to parks, um, and just to have them talk about their story in proximity to a really beautiful park in our system. Um, and that, of course, we think of the, those oral histories as data. This, this photograph is really wonderful sort of input and representation of our system. And then here's the other um, tool that I wanted to highlight and encourage you to actually engage with it tonight. So we actually just rolled out this texting tool. You'll see these signs across the park system. Um, and, and so you can actually text your park dreams to 612-712-2827. We tried to get parks, but it didn't work. Um, <laughs> and so please try it out. It's fun. It'll be, it'll be about two months of, kind of call and response. Every couple of weeks, you'll get a text, um, basically taking an, a survey, but in a really fun, interactive way, um, and hopefully very accessible, one that breaks down. Um, I think it's hopefully really accessible to youth, uh, to people that are using the parks. We also plan to put these in buses. so they actually will be also a way to outreach to folk that aren't necessarily coming to parks. Um, so please engage and, and let me know what you think. 
And there are, of course, other ways to, to get in, involved. Uh, we are a planful city. So you, oh, of course, we have community meetings. We'll be out at events. Sign up for the website. Um, there's also, as you walk out, if you didn't grab one on your way in, there are Dream Park cards, which um, are basically our suggestion cards for Minneapolis parks that we have built into this process uh, with this frame of what are your dreams for Minneapolis parks. So uh, please share your dreams. And uh, I know you're already all big thinkers about parks if you're in this room tonight. So thank you so much. And it's now my honor to introduce uh, Commissioner Silver. And um, I look forward to, to hearing more about innovations in New York parks. Thank you. So as Carrie transitions, first I want to thank you for the Minneapolis Parks Foundation for inviting me. It's certainly a pleasure to be, be here. This is probably my fifth or sixth time in Minneapolis. That was the number one question. People say the first time here. Nope, not my first time, but I've enjoyed it every time I've come to visit. I uh, also want to give a shout out to a former employee, Jeremy. Just raise your hand. And his wonderful wife, Kelly. Jeremy was, a, was on our, a leader in our forestry division in New York City, so it's always a delight to see him. Can't wait for him to come back. <laughs> uh, so before I get started, hi, Mitchell Silver, Jeremy, where's the work? Uh, well, as you all know from New York City, and as you can say, we have a big system, uh, but every time I come to Minneapolis, we all know every year, Trust of Public Land comes up with a park score, and oh my God, Minneapolis, St. Paul, one, two, two, one. <sighs> I got so upset, I said, you know, TPL, you need to change the ranking. Number one, the best dressed park leader should count for something. <laughs> the coolest park system and assets. Actually, you're right, I saw Al, he's a cool dresser. <laughs> But we're trying to see how we could move up in the ranking. But every year it comes out, it's like, oh, here we go again, Minneapolis. So I'm coming here, always in awe of your park system. So I'm going to share with you at least some of the challenges and what we're doing in New York City uh, to talk about really what's next. So just take it in context, different city, different issues. But I have to say I'm always impressed when I see the work that you're doing here, the fact that you had the foresight to save all that land up front. Uh, unfortunately for us, Robert Moses and the highway system, they kind of shaped our city. And so to have your parks really set a framework uh, is really to be applauded. Because I, when I was here for Greater Green a couple years ago, biked the 25 miles, I was in awe of your park system. So you should all be very proud. Now, uh, it was stated, my background, I'm an urban planner by training. I've been in parks now for about five years. I'll never forget the day I was announced and one of the newspapers said, you know, ex-planner becomes parks commissioner. I was like, how can you say something like that? When you're a planner, you're a planner for life. And all my planning friends started making fun of me. You're a sellout, you traitor, how could you go to parks? It wasn't until a year later when we had our national conference in New York City that I finally got my redemption. I said, you know, I've been in now in the parks department for about a year. And you all in parks know this. People literally hug you when you open up a park. They literally come up and hug you. And I told my friends at the plan conference, says no one ever in my entire career hugged me for completing a comprehensive plan. So <laughs> I should tell the videographer, I, I do move around a bit. I'll try to stay somewhat stationary. I'm working with you. Got it, OK. <laughs> so I'm excited to talk about really what's next uh, in New York City parks. Um, before I do that, I want to take a step back, because I always like to establish a context. Where do we come from? Where are we going? And if you look at our park system going back to the mid-19th century, and this is in England, this is in Oxford, it was parks and gardens. Public spaces were something you stroll through. You didn't stop, have a picnic, or sit. You just walked through it and you observed the gardens. That was the 19th century. Then you fast forward to the late 19th century, early 20th century, and now this profession called landscape architecture emerged. For the first time, we purposely created public spaces for all to enjoy. You're looking at Bethesda Terrace in Central Park and we shaped the land for people to enjoy. This was totally new to the United States, and it just started rippling across the country that now we want to set aside public spaces free for all people, regardless of race, income, housing situation, that this was for you. Then we entered the parks and the recreational phase, where it became parks and recreation. This was a time in New York City 
when kids were dying in the street because both horse carriages and cars were running them over. They didn't have a place to play. There were people dying in the East River because they did not have an adequate place to swim and they wanted to cool off. And Robert Moses, there are two. There's pre-war Robert Moses and the evil post-war Robert Moses. <laughs> But the pre-war Robert Moses built over 600 playgrounds and built these incredible public work facilities for now people to go and swim and enjoy, and the drownings in the East River went down. So that period from the 1930s to the 1960s, but the parks and recreation label stuck. Then we fast forward to the late, 19th, late 20th century, and now this is whole environmental movement began. The industrial cities, land that was left over from industry was just there, barren. And this whole movement of reclaiming this bruised and contaminated land started to transform cities across the country. You're looking at the west side of Manhattan, Riverside Park. This was now a place where shipping and industry used to occur. And now it's being healed, cleaned up, and returned back to the public. And I believe this was the evolution of New York City started with taking this neglected, abused land that had incredible views and access to the water and giving it back to the public. And it's not just land. Who knew an abandoned railroad that was traveling across the west side in the meatpacking district could now be transformed into what is now known as the High Line, getting over eight million visitors a year. Unloved, contaminated, unused land now given back to the public. And I can go on and on. This is Brooklyn Bridge Park. I don't live that far from here. As a kid, I couldn't wait to get down there and see what it was like, but it was just a shipping place with containers, and now it was healed, converted, and given back to the public. Like Minneapolis, New York City is now trying to give their best waterfront land to the public to enjoy. And then I still can't believe to this very day that you now at Brooklyn Bridge Park can kayak at this part of New York. Unheard of and it's changing the way people think about the cities, and I firmly believe this is the evolution of New York, started with the transformation of our public spaces and our industrial land, giving it back to the public. So the big question is, what's next in the 21st century? I believe, number one, parks are not just green spaces. These are spaces for people, and you'll see how I'll drill down. Because say you'll say, yes, I agree it's for people, no. It is truly for people and not these green islands just sitting there in isolation. They're not just for physical health, but also for mental health. Study after study will tell you just being in green space will have an effect on your mental health. Don't take a mental health day, just take a walk in the park for 20 minutes. Anxiety down, stress down, joy up. And so you see this transformation taking place. It's also serving multiple purposes, not just an amenity, it's also for infrastructure. And in the age of climate change, it's now very often becoming the first line of defense. So in the 21st century, parks are serving multiple purposes. And so many of our parks that you'll see, it's not just a green space, it's collecting stormwater, or it's contributing with our Million Tree Campaign for clean air and clean water and a heat island effect. They're not just for green spaces, they're serving multiple purposes. So when I came as commissioner, we had to have a vision. Equity was very important to the mayor. I'll go very quickly. These are the five strategic initiatives that we're pursuing. Tonight, I'll have time to only talk about my presentation about equity, planning, and placemaking. Uh, here are some of the other issues that we're addressing. You can certainly ask me about that in the presentation. Little footnote about caring. Uh, I feel that we cannot just maintain our parks, but we have to care for them as well. It's another level. It's another level because maintenance to me is a checklist. Caring goes far deeper. It comes from a different place of the soul. I have now a 20-year-old child. When I raised her, I didn't maintain her. I cared for her and nurtured her. It's something very different. And so now in the agency, we're talking about the difference between maintaining and caring. We have lots of friends group. People are volunteering their time to help care for the park because they love it that much. It's not just maintenance. That's a checklist is something that's far deeper. So when I came on board, uh, the mayor challenged me to come up with this whole issue about equity. He read on his platform of a tale of two cities. He felt there were great inequities in our park system. And there was this proposal from a senator that said, I got it. What we're going to do is take money from the richest conservancy or just go to the Minneapolis Park Foundation, take their budget, <laughs> portion of it, and then spread it on um, the lesser served parks. And I said, Mayor, that's not going to work. He said, OK. 
You got six months to come up with a solution. And we came up with this framework for an equitable future. Well, what is it? Essentially, I want to put it in context. Uh, New York City spent close to $6 billion over 20 years improving its park system. We acquired over 1,100 acres to expand our system. And we adopted the TPL walk score. And right now, which we have 81.5%. San Francisco, as you all know, is the only one, or may not know, that has a perfect 100% score. And I thought that was great, to be within a walk to a park. Wonderful. But there was one caveat. I felt it should not just be about proximity. It had to be about quality. Because I walked to some of those parks in the walk score, and I would not let my child or grandchild step foot in that space. And you see some of them in a second. So while proximity was important, the walk score was important, but to me it was also about quality. And I felt we had to have a better approach, it had to be equitable, and when I use the word equitable, it means fairness. Are we fair about how we invest in our parks across the city? Are we fair about how we maintain our parks across the city? And to make a long story short, the answer was no. We had to find a way to come to this conclusion, so rather than polling everyone, we decided to take a data-driven approach to find out how equitable were we in investing in our parks over the past 20 years? I told you six billion we spent. We wanted to find out how many of our parks in New York City, there's about 2,000, do we spend less than a quarter of a million dollars over 20 years? That's a drop in the bucket. And it turns out there were 215 parks. 215 parks hiding in plain sight. 20 years from kindergarten to college that park saw almost no investment. And while they're walking by other neighborhoods and seeing all these new features, their park was frozen in time and saw no change. And the mayor and I said, that's not fair and it has to change. So we came up with this approach. It was very daring. The mayor put his money where his mouth is. And we decided to do an unprecedented amount of over $300 million, not just to spruce up, to totally transform what were these Robert Moses era playgrounds. Now, of the 67, I can tell you as of today, we started in 2014, we've already completed 42, and by the end of this year, we've completed 44. And the stories behind these transformations are unbelievable. I'll never forget one time this man from Staten Island, big African-American, about 6'5", 300 pounds. He said, what are you doing here? I thought nobody cared. He grew up in this neighborhood his whole life, and he couldn't believe we were there to begin to think about transforming his park. And so we did some TART improvements just as a down payment because our capital process takes three to four years to transform a park. We want to show an act of good faith by doing sports coding, planting, repairing equipment to show that we cared. So I'm going to go through an example of some of our parks. There's one of them. Isn't that a nice place to play? Look at it. <laughs> Robert Moses era. That's actually a baseball diamond right there. This is what we grew up in New York City. This is what we played in. And guess what? That was a Newark score. My question is, is that a park or a parking lot? This is what many kids experienced of living in New York City and having a park. Well, this one's a little bit better. It has a bench and trees, so this is one you can go hang out, have a picnic. This, too, was in the walk score. And for many communities, while others' neighborhood got transformed parks, this is what they were left with. So we knew something had to change. Now, there's something else unique in New York City. I don't know, do you have this here in Minneapolis? <laughs> Adults not allowed, unless you're accompanied by a child. This got me so frustrated. We now change this rule. You know, I told my staff, we can't change this rule. My alternative is, we're going to have a concession at each park that has a sign so you can rent a child so you can go in <laughs> and have a good time. This, too, wasn't fair. So that walk score, 85, 81.5%, if you were a child, perfect walk score. If you were an adult, no, you did not have access to all of these parks. And if you're a senior citizen just looking to sit down, sorry you can't sit here, you don't have a child, go walk another 10 blocks in a park you can go in. We changed this rule. This is no longer the case citywide because it wasn't fair. That walk score wasn't true. So those are some of the things we dealt with from the equity point of view. So I'm going to share with you now uh, our new approach. We decided to go in a whole new direction. Now we are using a lot more spray features in many of our parks. Almost every single one has a spray feature. If you can't get to a beach or a pool, 
There's now one you know, neighborhood park, over 700 in the city, where we now have these spray features. Adult fitness equipment, very popular. The other thing that's very popular in our city now is dog runs. Millennials may not have a, you know, a lot of mates or partners, but they definitely have dogs. <laughs> Sometimes two. So adult fitness, dog runs, dog parks are very, very popular. Uh, also, we're trying to use vibrant colors. These are now destinations, community centers. Take away from that old gray asphalt and use vibrant colors to really make these the town centers, town squares, the gathering places that people want to go to. And what is such high demand is we want landscaping green. We're also using stormwater retention to collect it under all the parks. So when we design it, we now make sure it captures the stormwater in the park. And people just want to see green, soften up the asphalt, have more gardens, and so we're delivering on that as well. And as was stated, we're now going to more multi-generational design. Uh, seniors tend to like to sit at the periphery of a park. Lots of seating, lots and lots of seating. We'll discuss the question of homeless later if that comes up. But we want to make sure people enjoy it. These are outdoor living rooms. It's where people connect, eat, whether on a cell phone. We want to make these very inviting for all generations. So that's part of our new program. So I'm going to share with you just two of these transformations. One is completed. This one is under construction. In the South Bronx, this is called the Garrison Park. It's right next to a community college. Uh, there's a nice entrance, pretty neglected. What I like about this park, unlike the other one that's all asphalt, this one has a lot of vegetation in it. And there it is. <laughs> I, I want you to look at this for a second and think that you go to Fairview Park and then you go to something like this. What does it tell you? Does nobody care? Why do I have to have a park that looks like that? And it's been like this for well over 20 years. This park is now being changed. And by the way, this park too was on the walk score. So that's why when I look at scores and indexes, you've got to appeal a little bit deeper. So we took a look using our thinking, making sure we want to be more of a commons, there's a college, as I said, it's across the street. We thought hard to make sure it was multi-generational. Uh, we wanted to make sure a lot of access, a lot of flow, because I believe good uses push out bad uses. We don't like to plant anti-spaces. We don't want these people or that people. No, we want the flow. We want activity coming in. And it went from what you saw to this. It is now under construction, and this will now be a place of dignity for this community. The college, young people, old people, all to enjoy a space. And basically, it was something that I wouldn't even go to before. A total change. Grand Avenue Playground in the Bronx. This was a tough one because a lot of gambling and drug activity happened here. We had to go there and clean it up every morning. Right over here is where we found a lot of little alcohol bottles. And so the police would chase them away. They would come back. Yeah, that's where they were found. We had to clean it up on a regular basis. And what do we do? This park is now transformed. I'll never forget opening day. There were 250 people waiting for this park to be opened. And what was sad was that the neighborhood didn't even use it because they were intimidated by the activity. When we closed the park for construction, we then started to work with local neighborhood groups to reclaim the space. And on opening day, I'll never forget, a woman in Spanish came up to me and says, muchos gracias, because she said, we can't go anywhere for vacation. This is where we take our kids for vacation. And even now, every day in the summer, this park is packed. And what I love about this next photo, this was a hot day in July. Look at the refreshing look at this little girl's <laughs> face where she's just, ah. Oh. And a woman at the public housing across the street was in tears opening day. She says, you don't understand. This park was here on paper. It wasn't for us. And now we have a space we can call our own to create memories and friends and the grandmothers and mothers can sit together and talk and have a safe space for their kids to play. For 20 years, it was neglected. And now it's bringing this neighborhood together. I want to go ramp up a bit. We're doing it for small parks. We're not doing it for larger parks. To this day, this is in High Bridge in Washington Heights. I have no idea what those red things are. Sometimes I get word when staff goes on vacation to Europe and they come back and say, I have an idea. <laughs> what in the world are those red things? We used the same concept to make sure it was multi-generational. The play units were so far away, I felt bad. The kids were running from one to the other, like, wait, 
that's just too far. The parent can't keep an eye because usually you have 5 to 12 and 2 to 5. And we decided that this is the only flat part in the park. Let us make it something of quality. Again, 20 years, no investment. It went from this, this is under construction, to this. Opening, not opening day, the day we cut the broke ground, people coming out said, this is for us? This is for us? You mean not inferior play equipment, not high fences? This is for us? And they're now seeing the transformation by having an equity lens to make sure that everyone deserves a quality park. This one is a little bit hard, but it's a true story. Uh, the demographics of the neighborhood was changing. This was a football field in Astoria Park. And the community was uncomfortable with soccer now being played in the football field. It wasn't a use that they liked, and so they asked then, the Parks Department, and Jeremy, I don't know if you know this story, asked them to plant trees in the football field to stop people from playing soccer. The good news, guess what? What happened to the trees? They're gone. This is now under construction. It'll be opening about a month or two. It is now officially, see the net, a soccer field <laughs> with a running track. And the community, we had to work with them, now understood that we have to embrace all sports, all ethnicities, all change. And this is now the brand new soccer field and football field in Astoria Park. I love to see these love notes in our parks. Some people want to paint it over, I embrace them. But I want to share with you a couple of stories of what this Community Parks Initiative meant to me and to the community. The first one I'm going to share with you is in Staten Island. It was, I asked my staff, when you do a design, always look at the context larger. Don't just look at the park, because parks are connected to things. Neighborhoods, streets, homes, churches, housing. So we looked across the street, there was a nursing home. And I told my staff, find out if that nursing home had any outdoor space. It really didn't, it had a small yard. So I said, design a seating garden so when people come to visit their loved ones, they have a place of dignity they can sit with their family. On the day we cut the ribbon, this woman in a wheelchair called me over. She was squeezing my hand. She said, were you responsible for this park? And I said, yes. She said, because of you, I'm going to live longer because now I sit here and watch my kids play basketball, and there it is. Another asphalt playground. And staff outdid themselves. I cannot believe the garden. And this is where she sat. We have a cutout for uh, a wheelchair, and that's where her kids play basketball. And she said, on behalf of the entire nursing home, they love you because this is now the place that they go. And the nursing home is right there across the street. Thinking about the context, thinking about the generation, planning for people, not just a green space. The borders don't end at the edge of the park. It bleeds into the neighborhood. And that's what we're able to do. The next story, this other woman stopped me. We opened up, we changed this baseball field park into a walking trail, and she saw me out there, she grabbed me, she said, I gotta take a picture, show my doctor. I lost five pounds, please take a picture with me. And I said, sure. <laughs> there she was, got a picture with the commissioner. You know, so I was like, that's what works? Five pounds, he wanted her to walk, she got healthy. Another one we're doing in Betsy Head, I'm a runner, if you don't, well, I'm a runner, and so they always invite me out to groups, but this group called We Run Brownsville is an organization started by a woman who had a double mastectomy and had a heart attack. She started this running group in Betsy Head to make sure people come out and get healthy. We were doing that field, but I have to tell you, there they are, an amazing group, and I realized then how this movement was generational because that day, the kids came out, the grandkids came out, and they were watching their parents and grandparents get healthy. It was amazing, and we were doing this entire field, which is absolutely awful in Betsy Head. The last story, which I hope I can get through, it's a very difficult. Another asphalt playground on opening day, there was a little boy about eight years old Hispanic that refused to go into the park, would not walk in. So I asked one of my staff workers to talk to him to find out what's going on. And little boy would not come in the park because he said he wanted to know how much it cost to go into that park. Nothing that nice was in his neighborhood. And there's the park. And there he is running. His life and the kids' net neighborhood is going to change. And it hurt because in his mind, 
He was used to seeing those asphalt playgrounds and thought something this nice couldn't be free. And so the power of what we do, of thinking differently, and not just looking at equity, but it's about people and their lives is something that's very transformative. And it's something that's very near and dear to me. So that is why I'm saying pursuing equity, parks for all, we've got to look at it from a person's perspective because you are changing lives, you're changing behaviors, you're changing relationships, and all be facilitated if you just look at parks very differently from an equity lens. And again, all these places neglected for 20 years. They went from being neglected to being first on the list. Okay, let's take a breath because I need that. Okay. All right. We're now going to transition to, to the second part. Uh, this is planning and placemaking. I'm a planner, so I was very delighted to bring placemaking and planning to parks. And so I had to talk to staff that there's experience of place, there's memory of place, and that we just can't create a park or a public space. You're making a place. And you have to understand what that means. We are very careful at the outreach that we do. There are six generations alive at any given time, and I know that for sure because everyone is on this list. If you're not, you're dead, so I know you're all on this list. <laughs> and we do our public meetings because each generation has different values, needs, and aspirations. And we carefully make sure we have public meetings that all those groups are represented. We don't plan for who shows up at the meeting. We do our outreach. We look at the demographics of the neighborhood and make sure their voices are captured. And that's something that's very hard to do because we tend to plan for who's in the room. We have to do additional work. So in New York, for us, our XYZ generation, which is 53 and under, represents about 60%. We want to make sure that if we have the older generation, we have to have a conversation about who are we planning for, and make sure all voices are represented. Because previous generations were consumers of goods or are consumers of goods, but the younger generations are consumers of experiences. That's why they go to places, because of the experience of the place. I was traveling around Minneapolis all day. I was excited because there were some cool places that I wanted to experience. I saw them. I felt them. And so I tell my staff, we should not just be designers and builders, but ex I'm sorry, designers and planners, but experienced builders. When we look at a park, we think about the experience, and it varies from generation to generation. So it's totally changed the approach about how we plan for parks. I always say people may eat and sleep in their homes or apartments, but they live in the public realm. That's where they come together. That's where they spend their time. That's where they are outdoors. And so if that's the case, we have to think differently about this precious public space that is ours, that's free, that we should have access to. New York City, we get 130 million visits to our parks every year. Think about that. That's more than the entire state of Florida. 130 million visits to our parks. That's how much it means to us. It makes our city livable, it makes us healthy, and it makes us happy. For example, who would go and watch cars drive by sitting at this bench? This is on the High Line. They're there because of the experience. I wouldn't sit there, but they love it. It's a hot destination. Watching cars just drive by, just drive by. <laughs> they actually had an opera. I don't know if you saw this. If you Google it, Highland had an opera where each person had to make a sound based on the color of the car. It's the most bizarre thing they were saying right there. Kind of go, hoo, ho, hoo, but New York. <laughs> and then, right next to Madison Square Park, this is asphalt, underperforming asphalt. We then decide to take this land, Jeanette City Khan, she put some benches, some flowers, and what was a road is now a dynamic public space. So when I travel to different places, they say, we don't have land for parks. Really? You have roads. If you have a road, you have a park. This is now more popular than Madison Square right next door. So as I close, we want to talk about public realm. Streets and sidewalks represent the public realm in New York City. Parks represent 14%, streets and sidewalks 26%. Combined, that's 40% of the public realm. We own it, it's free. But we divide it up between agencies. The average citizen does not know when they're walking on apartment transportation property or parks property, and they don't care. But for some reason, the agencies do. So we're now planning on the public realm together. That's the same space I was referring to. Before that, this was all striped. Now it's just public space. We own it, we're using it. Someone. Famous one said, the sidewalk adjacent to the park should be considered the outer park. 
That person was Frederick Olmsted. You see a sidewalk, I see an outer park. And when I took the job, it actually said that the parks department should oversee the sidewalk next to a park. I was very excited about that. So here's Rufus King Park in Queens. You see a sidewalk. We're now going to convert this to a bioswale because this is now the outer park. And we love fences in New York City. That poor dog just wants to sniff a little bit of grass. But we put fences around all of our public spaces, and I don't know why. So rethinking the sidewalk and the public realm to make it more seamless and connected. This is the one that always baffles me. I have a feeling people thought the trees were going to run away at night, so we put a fence around to protect them. We watch them. They don't run away at night. And so we're taking down fences. We're lowering fences. People say, you can't do that. It makes the park less safe. Thank God you don't have that in Minneapolis. But in New York, it was a big deal. What do you mean you're taking down the fence? It's going to make the park less safe. Really? There's a fight going on halfway down the block. Can you tell me what's going on? You can't. So in fact, the fences were obscuring the sight lines, and you couldn't see what was going on. Here's another example of one of our community pools. This is where the kids go to have their summer meals when they're at the pool. But it doesn't look like this. It looks like this. So what, what are we telling our children when I have to cage you in to have lunch? I've learned that when we do our new design, if we respect the community, they respect us back in return. And so, of course, because I'm commissioner now and I love to do this, it went from this to this. And now we're going to replace the benches. And this is a more civil way. We now want to play as part of our Cool Pools initiative to cut down the fences and have these places more respectful for the community. That gave birth to this program called Parks Without Borders. The goal of this program uh, was $50 million. It was a pilot, but now it's now currently underway. Very exciting program. The goal is to take the edges, entrances, and adjacent park spaces to transform them. So for example, all this space right here is parkland. And now we're going to use it. Not big asphalt, but actually incorporate it into the design. For entrances, we're going to start taking fences down to make it more open and transparent, like Minneapolis. We're going to lower the fences so it improves the sight line so you can see in it. We will save fences for dog runs and certain sports, but for the other ones, we'll lower it. And we put more benches on the sidewalk because parks close, but sidewalks never close. So if you're a senior and want a place to sit and relax while you're taking, or if you're a parent and you want to sit with the stroller just to relax, we now want to expand our street furniture outside the park because the sidewalk is the outer park. And we want to take advantage of these fenced-in spaces that nobody uses. It's not a diorama. So we're taking the fences down and giving that space back to the public. So we wanted to make sure as a pilot, nominate your park. We thought we would get 1,000 nominations. We got 6,000 citywide. Unfortunately, we could only pick eight. <laughs> uh, all of them are under construction. I'll show you a couple of them. I'll show you quickly. Uh, so it covered 692 parks. You can see from the dots where the most votes were for their park. Uh, this one happened to be Prospect Park, which is what I'm going to share with you, and then Seward Park right there. So those are the two parks. Those are the eight we selected, uh, and all these are now under construction. The first one, Seward Park, is the oldest playground in the United States in the Lower East Side. It has this beautiful garden. Before I came in, this garden was locked. Only a few people had the key. Now we're opening it up while this is under construction. That's an old library, an active library in the back. But it, too, had a lock fence. You had to walk all the way around the block just to get to the library, when literally the library is right there. So we decided that we had to, of course, lower the fence, reconstruct the sidewalk. Uh, this is the site plan. So I, that lock gate I shared with you was right there. There's the entrance. So you had to walk all in here, come through here. Oh, actually, that was locked. Go through here to get to the, when literally you were that close. Uh, so what the design looked like. I'm now standing on the steps of the library. You see the lock gate to my left. You can see the fact there's no benches. This is in front of a library. We decided now to transform this. This is almost complete. And it's now going to look like this. Space we owned, thinking differently, better access to public space that we already owned just by thinking differently about how we plan for our public spaces. Prospect Park, another famous Olmsted Vox Park. This is where I grew up. My brother and I ran this trip all the time. When I was growing up, I was like, why can't we open and put an opening in this fence? There's three quarters of a mile with no opening. 
And so someone says, you can't open it. Nobody wants to walk through there. Really? <laughs> so this was the other candidate. We're actually now going to do it. So this is what the entrance, well, there was no entrance. We're now going to put one in right here. This is a new design. Just to show you what it looks like, this is what it's going to be. First time in 50 years, there's a new entrance to the park. And now it's on the less affluent side of the park. They no longer have to walk three quarters of a mile. Now they have better access to a green space. Here's another view. And I'm so excited because I knew I was coming here. Just last week, we broke ground. There it is. We're cutting through. So in closing, I want you to really understand we have different park systems, the importance of parks for all, equity, access, stay safe, is primarily about people. And you've got to spend the time to have those conversations, town hall, informal, to truly understand what's going on. But then do the analysis to find out, are we truly investing equally to all the parks, and are we putting elements that appeal to them based upon our changing demographics? So our goal in New York City is to create an equitable park system that is seamless public realm, that is resilient and safe for present and future generations. Again, I commend you for your outstanding park system. I look forward to your questions, and thank you all very much. First question, uh, while you guys are writing down your questions, uh, how do you care for a park? How, how do you suggest that, that folks who want to go and, and participate in the upkeep of their park, well, how do you care for them? I always ask staff to think of the reverse. We can all go into a space and you look at something like saying, doesn't anybody care? Mm -hmm. And it could be however that's defined. So maintenance is you have to go through quickly, pick up the litter, but caring is, wait a minute, that's broken. I need to write that down. I need to follow up. Oh, excuse me, that seems to be that there's a sign someone put up there that doesn't belong there. Let me make sure I take it down. Is going the extra level that may not be on your maintenance checklist to show that I really care for this public space. Our friends group do that, and now more and more our staff is now taking more ownership. And I actually hear them saying, thank you, Commissioner. I don't just want to maintain the park. I want to care for it. So it's given that extra level of attention that's not on your checklist that you know needs to get done because you don't want someone to say, look at that, there's tape route wrapped around the base of this tree, doesn't anybody care? And a crew was just here cleaning the park 20 minutes ago. Mm -hmm. So that's to me is the difference between maintenance and care. Sure, um, and when you looked at the, um, these parks that were neglected, that the 215 parks, how did you decide what features to put in? Did you go directly to the neighborhoods and say, hey, what would you like to see here? Well, the first thing we did is that we, typically had public meetings for our park designs, all of them. But we did it in the afternoon. And I told my staff, uh, that's gotta change. So we shifted the meeting from the afternoon to the evening. It went from five to 10 people showing up to over 100. We have outreach coordinators. We go specifically to the closest school, faith-based institution, the nonprofits to make sure we get a good showing, and then we supplement it. So we literally have a conversation. We give them choices. We'll tell them not only here's your park, here are some of the nearby parks. So if you don't want to have a handball court, there's one two blocks away, they can reimagine what this public space can be based upon their needs and aspirations. And so they give us the program elements. They don't design it, but they tell us we want this percentage active, this percentage passive, and then we help them design it. But most all of them say, get rid of the asphalt, more green, more trees, more shade. And so that's something we're able to accommodate. Right. And um, were these parks in neighborhoods that were people of, yeah. predominantly people of color, so, low-income neighborhoods? Right. So let me back up. So first, we picked zones. It was based on income, density, growth, and also lack of investment. So it was all those criteria. So we're, we're, they were in the places that wouldn't surprise people, the most underserved neighbors in the city of New York, and uh, which was unfortunate. But yes, they were all in those underserved communities. And so we were able to target 67 in those neighborhoods based on that criteria. And for, we saw those photos of the befores and afters with the, with the tall fences. Why were those fences so tall in the first place? I don't know, you know, it's funny because I grew up in New York, I left to work in North Carolina, and I came back and it's like, what's up with the fences? They didn't have fences in North Carolina. 
I don't know why. They had spikes, too. It was like you were defending against, you know, the, the British are coming. We won that war. You know, it's like we could take the fences down. I think they were high enough that people wouldn't travail. And the spikes and a message like, don't come into this park. But the 70s and 80s in New York City was a very scary time. Sure. We go back to the early part of the 19th, 20th century, we didn't see those type of fences around our parks. So during the time when people became very fearful about New York City parks, they felt we had a secure the perimeter to keep the swings and slides safe. Hmm. Well, I, I, as you mentioned, that, that period of time in, in New York's history, I mean, there was, was it a crime issue? Is mostly people were just like... I think it was a crime yeah. issue. There was probably a lot of vandalism. Uh, we didn't have the homeless back then in, in the early 70s and 80s to what it is today. Uh, but now less than 1% of all crimes happen in our parks. Parks are safe in New York. So it was very difficult if you grew up in New York in the 70s and 80s to let go of these fences. And so it took some time. Once we lowered it, the one thing people said is, oh my goodness, did you buy more land? The parks looked bigger. I said, no, we just took down the fences. And it's like if you have a house, you break down some walls, you have this common space. And they said, I feel safer because I can now see in the park and out of the park. But it took a while. Uh, but now, two years after the program started, people are generally accepting it. Right, right. Um, I'll take some questions, too, when you get a chance. But I, I'll, otherwise, I'll keep, I'll keep pestering um, our guest here. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, and I keep them coming as well. So here's a um, question I was going to ask you. Uh, how do you address concerns that um, homeless populations will, so-called, in, in quotes here, take over um, improved parks and public spaces? Okay. Everybody take a deep breath. Parks for all. That includes the homeless. Parks are free for all, and that includes the homeless. Now, having said that, we expect everyone to follow the park rules. Uh, you cannot stay in a park overnight, whether you have a house or you don't, or you have a home or don't have a home. Uh, encampments, we handle separately. You cannot have an encampment. Uh, but in terms of the homeless enjoying a public space, is they cannot go to a free public space. Umstead, design parks, parks are for all. Homeless fit in all category. It is uncomfortable for many uh, because they feel they take it over. What we do, number one, is that we try to provide activities in our parks, if people are concerned about it, to make sure that they're inviting uh, and that everyone can be in them together. I'm gonna to share with you a story that really changed my thinking. Uh, we, there was a park in Harlem, Morningside Park, has a waterfall. This community invested a lot of money into having the waterfall restored. And we, on opening day, the woman knocked on my window and I was in my car before I was about to leave and she handed me 33 cents. I'm like, what is it, 33 cents? She said, oh, that homeless man over there, he gave all the money he had because he comes to this park every day under that waterfall and his place makes him feel alive. This is his sanctuary when he leaves the shelter and he goes there. What am I supposed to do with that? This is the place for that small period of life, whatever issues he's going through, he is suffering. We have a lot of services in New York to work with the homeless. But one of the things that concerns us is that public space are for all. We work with them, try to get mental health services, try to get shelter for them, but we do let them know that parks are open for all. And even police know if they're not bothering anyone, they can enjoy the public space. I think some look at the more extreme examples and feel uncomfortable, but it's something where we have to come to terms that park uh, homeless are welcome in our parks. Uh, here's another question um, dealing with uh, the topic of gentrification, we, we touched on this a little bit before your presentation. And the questioner asks, what is your perspective on the unintended consequences of investments in public spaces, such as patterns of gentrification? How can we continue investing in public spaces and prevent this? Uh, I'm gonna talk about gentrification and the fear of gentrification. I think gentrification is always a code word. I think there are more people afraid about the fear of gentrification than actually gentrification being a reality. We have not found we improve a public space in most neighborhoods that it leads toward gentrification. And so that hasn't been proven to me yet. And so we always tell us to show an example. The High Line, yes, there was a meatpacking district, nothing there. That did lead to a transformation of that neighborhood. But what concerns me is that we have a choice of improving the park or not improving the park. 
I'd rather improve the park and not deny another generation of a family and children from a quality open space because a few people may fear it may lead to gentrification. So at least me as commissioner, we'll work with them, we'll work with the city to see how we can address some of the other issues of displacement, but I refuse to allow a park stay in disrepair for another generation because a few people are free, have the fear of gentrification. So that's our response. Uh, again, as commissioner, I've done over 500 park projects. I have not seen one yet that led to gentrification. So it's more of, to me, in my opinion, is gentrification real? Yes. Is it every park project? No. Sure. Uh, here's another question. This from someone who is interested in uh, some advice from you. Um, they ask, what uh, advice do you have for a student of landscape design and planning? Uh, one is that make sure your profession is not the only one that's designed a project. You need to work with other professions. Uh, architecture, planning, urban design, art, so whatever it is, just make sure in your career that your profession is not the only one that has all the answers. Reach out, touch other professions, speak to stakeholders, and I think that you would do well. Or you can come work for parks. We have lots of jobs for landscape architects. <laughs> I'm told I'm the biggest employer of landscape architects on the planet. So we have about 400 architects, landscape architects, and engineers. All right. So where's that student? Come work for me. <laughs> Good to know. But I'm leaving in two years, so you've got to hurry up. Get that degree. <laughs> Uh, here's a question about, a uh, person asks, have you seen a change in crime safety uh, in the communities as the parks are improved? Yes, we have. We've now, uh, number one, all the parks that we've seen that have been brand new, we have not seen any level of vandalism, so it makes me very happy. Uh, and actually, you are seeing uh, the crime actually go down or stabilize. So the answer is yes. The improved sight lines are helping a lot. The fact that people feel so honored and respected that we've now given them a quality public space, that we see them sharing that respect in return. So we are seeing very positive numbers by all the parks that we've renovated. Uh, this person asks, they've heard that uh, New York City is planning an underground park in Lower East Side called the Low Line. Is this happening? <laughs> <laughs> it's great marketing. Um, it's not New York City Parks Department. There is a group that there is a tunnel under the under Lower East Side. They call it the low line. It's a concept. They want to daylight it through popping lights through the, you know, through the floor. Uh, it is an idea, but it's an idea. Okay. That, that reminds me of a question I had uh, as well as how much unclaimed area do you have in New York to, to, to dedicate to new parks, creating new spaces, besides some of the streetscapes that you'd... Um, well, we still have 40. Well, the good thing is that we have this great relationship with the Department of Transportation. I don't know if Public Works is here. But we're reclaiming road all over the place. Uh, and I challenge places that are park starved or don't have a lot of land that look to your street. Um, you have some very wide streets, Minneapolis, uh, <laughs> and make some great parks. Um, because we have a grid that uh, goes on a, an axis, we have these wonderful triangular spaces and we're converting a lot of those to plazas and parks that's done with transportation, but we have this great relationship of reclaiming uh, a lot of our streets. If you go to New York, we're now necking down what were four lanes, it's now two lanes, and it's now a bike lane with parking. It's freaking everybody out, but it's really rethinking our modes of transportation where the car is not the dominant mode of transportation, and we communicate that through our public realm. Uh, so, yes, we look for opportunities where we can take a street and extend it next to a park. Uh, we look for opportunities where there was this underperforming asphalt that was a triangle, that goes from asphalt to now public space. So it's something that we enjoy and you come to New York City, it's popping up all over the place. Right. Oh, and I know and it's paint, flower pots, chairs. Right. Minneapolis is doing a lot of that as well and I think we've heard a lot of, I'm sure some of you have heard some the of the public re response right. to the new bike lanes in many places and that they have yeah. less room to drive their cars. So yes. there's plenty of those. Uh, I have some questions now about uh, young people and their involvements in the parks and planning. Uh, this questioner asks, uh, do you engage youth in improving and um, uh, improving and caring for your parks? Yes. Uh, first of all, young people, we have a lot of volunteers. We get about 60,000 volunteers a year to do various volunteer events. We have 600 friends groups throughout the city, and a lot of them involve the youth. 
Uh, our youth love to plant trees. They love to clean up, so they're very engaged in our volunteer efforts. In terms of engagement, uh, we have a lot of opportunities in our rec centers, our leagues, uh, whether it's baseball, football, soccer, and so we have many, many ways we engage young people. In our public meetings, we make sure we also reach out to the youth. So we, we try to do that in, in multiple ways, and uh, even social media, which is their other form. I don't know if it's Snapchat, I'm losing track of what some of the <laughs> oh, there's so many. Young people here, TikTok. what's the latest one right now? Yeah, I think IG, TikTok. right? Instagram? Yeah. TikTok? TikTok? Yeah. Write that down, TikTok. Okay, yeah, no, no, yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not I'm not there yet. Uh, and another question about um, engaging young adolescents um, in this person wants to know, does the park system encourage healthy habits for young people of this age, young adolescents? Yes, we do. We have a lot of special programs throughout the year that we take. Uh, we have a whole mobile unit. Uh, so we try different things. We have Winter Jam. We have Adventure NYC, where we go to parks with climbing apparatus. So we have a whole mobile unit that we go to different parks. So we activate them, uh, and very often we'll go to places that are underprivileged. We have kids in motion. We send out our workers out to parks in the summertime to engage our kids. So we have a robust set uh, of, of initiatives, both in the summer and winter, that we go out there to engage our young people. Winter Jam is so cool. We have to make snow in Central Park. I know if it's Minneapolis, it's like, just go to my backyard. But in New York, we have to blow snow. For really? You get a snowmaker out? and It doesn't always snow in New York. Climate change. It's like, you know, yeah. it snows in May. I don't know. What's... Uh, this person, uh, this question says, um, well, kids are kids, um, but beyond soccer, have you um, seen demand for different yes. uses based on cultural differences? Pickleball. Do you have pickleball here? Pickleball. Oh, my God. I've never played. They just recently said, can we convert our tennis courts to pickleball? Pickleball, it's a combination of ping pong, tennis, but it's played with a wiffle ball and a paddle. It's very popular among our older generation, uh, but it's really catching fire indoor and outdoor. So pickleball is probably the biggest thing we see a, big, a movement on. How many people know pickleball? Yeah, yeah, some. See? Yeah. Good. Branch, you got to get I've not. Yeah, I know. I got to get with it. Uh, and speaking of other um, sports and, and recreation, a uh, question about skateboarding. Mm -hmm. um, uh, for instance, Thompson Square, Tompkins Square, Manhattan, skate, uh, skate space versus turf skateboarder voices were heard. What did you learn about the skateboard community? Were you involved in those conversations? They're really well connected and they're active. Uh, I learned, well, let me put in context if you didn't hear what's going on. So we're going to be rebuilding one of our parks and elevating it because this was an area low in Manhattan that got flooded. It's basically a 40-acre park that we're going to basically uh, tear everything down and elevate it by about eight feet. The concern was we're going to displace a lot of leagues that were playing, and we found a park in Tompkins Square where we can put in artificial turf so we can send the leagues there. I didn't know it was this cool, inf it wasn't an official skate park, but it was where every young skater learned how to skate. And it was called a TF training facility, and I had recommended putting a synthetic turf there. Lo and behold, about a few weeks later, we got 32,000 petition signatures from skaters around the planet. And so um, I finally decided that they need to keep their skating facility. I did not know of all the stories of young people who learn, I mean, people like 40 years old like saying, dude, man, I learned how to skate in that park. So I finally said, you could have it. So I made an announcement about two weeks ago, find another place to send the leagues. Right, right. But yeah, I learned that they're, they're cool, they're connected, they're young and old, uh, and uh, they really care a lot about that place. How much time do you spend, like, going out to individual communities? I mean, as a part of your work week, how often, how many hours do you think you spend going At out least once a day, and then if you hadn't seen the New York Times, I did the Sunday routine, because on Sundays I go incognito, if I can go incognito, and I visit a park, a set of parks every Sunday on my own. Right. Just because every time as a commissioner we have an event, it's like, this is so clean, <laughs> like what happened? And I, I wanted to see parks in their state, and so I just do this routine where I go out on a Sunday, yeah. I pick a couple of parks in a borough, and I just look around and inspect it, and then I come back and have a conversation with staff. It's not to slap their hand. I want to tell them, what do you need from me for you to be successful? Uh, because there are things that I see that just trouble me, and uh, we have a conversation. So I love it. I get to observe people, watch people, and I get to know the park system. Right. How, uh, 
racially diverse is your, uh, your staff? The, the extremely diverse. Yeah. Extremely diverse. Both from my management team all the way down. I hired a commissioner of equal opportunity, so she's always watching demographics. We have recruiting tools. I did, she came up with LinkedIn. I never thought of using LinkedIn as a recruiting tool for a certain demographic groups, but she's good. And we make sure uh, we found out that there was a, not enough, in my opinion, women in leadership uh, in the field, in our maintenance and operations. And so we recruited and went out specifically to encourage more people to be leaders. Uh, and so that worked. Uh, so we have a whole focus, both starting at my leadership team, but it filters all the way down through the organization. Right. Um, but for forestry, forestry is the one we always had a challenge. Really? And so we're trying to find out how we can appeal more to communities of color to get into the whole forestry and horticulture. And Jerry, you, you, it was like 90% um, white, and so we're always trying to think of ways we can get more people involved. But across other than that, it's pretty diverse. Right. Um, I don't want to keep you too much longer. We're gonna, Tom, you want to go until late 30? Yeah. Okay. All Thank right. you all for staying. You're so polite. Yeah, yeah, Thank yeah. You. Everybody's, well, you know, and there's, there's always things going on here in Minneapolis, and I'm glad people can come down. I guess my last question was, what, have you found, like, what the most popular ask is that when, when you go to communities and ask, what are some of the things that you really want to see in your park, in this park that has not been developed for, for decades? Do you have a sense of what is the most popular thing that people want to see in their parks? This would, well, putting it in context, the first thing is if it's one of these asphalt spaces, people now want more green. Right. So that's it. Beyond that, you'd be surprised if it's the benches, the seating, the social spaces. That's why we're putting in more tables, picnic tables. Uh, we still have the checkerboard. You know, if you know New York, we have these kind of uh, concrete uh, checkerboard tables, but just places where people can sit and observe and have conversations. So that seems to be what are those social spaces, but in terms of the swings, the slides, you know, we always hear that. But they always want to know where those gathering places where people can sit, converse, and just be outdoors and just enjoy it. Yeah. So that seems to be very high on the list. But definitely get rid of the asphalt, soft, green, shade, that's like a must. Sounds great. Mitchell Silver, thanks very much. Appreciate thank it. Thank you, thank you very yeah. much. Thank you.